you have to worry about peaking for a race. In order to do that, and you can only, people can only peak two or three times a year. Most people twice, and a lot of people, to be frank, should only aim for like one. In order to peak, you have to shed. You should never look at your, your graph in training peaks or the, the distribution of your training load as one constant trend that goes up. If you never have any trends that go down, you're digging yourself a gigantic hole. <laughs> Go, buddy. All systems go. Welcome aboard. Hey, man. It's a crushing iron podcast, episode 359. 359. 359er. 359er. Did I catch a niner in there? Hey, what I did catch is the sun is out, which is. Whew, I will never take it for granted ever again. Now, I say that now, but then, but then come August, you know it's going to be like you know, 110 degrees, and you're like, yeah, it's, it's too hot to be outside. I'm just not going to go outside anymore. But it is warm here, warmer. The sun is out. There is not a cloud in the sky. And man, what a difference does that make? It has been, at least here in the south, and I know the weather's been very similar uh, to you in Nashville. I'm here in Chattanooga. But it's just been gloomy, gloomy and rainy. And that has just put even more of a damper on the isolation and social distancing and things that we're all going through but sun's out and i feel like there's a little bit of optimism in the air oh you feel it huh feel i it. do i feel i feel a little bit optimistic like i'm having a good day today i've I played a uh, peter pan and captain hook earlier with hayden uh so uh you know hanging in there I lost an arm but other than that i'm off to a pretty good start today good for you man yeah it's uh, i think it's all it's all in the uh, eye of the beholder man that is man and uh if it's your first time with your ears to the podcast we appreciate you tuning in it is uh the crushing iron podcast we come to you twice a week we have been for three years we have a obviously 358 uh archived episodes backlog you can go back and listen to with race directors uh, other interviewees and just for the most part it's just mike and i having a conversation as both uh, coaches and athletes we cover a wide variety of topics from uh, in-depth and specific training topics swim bike run to nutrition to uh anything you need to go do to prepare yourself for even specific races like Chattanooga 70.3, Ironman Chattanooga, all things Wisconsin, Louisville, Muncie, Ohio, some of our favorites. Uh, and then we cover a lot of things life, uh, how what's what goes on in our day-to-day lives often impacts our training, how our training can impact our lives. And we just do our best to have an open conversation, um, no sponsors, no ads, uh, no real objective uh, other than just to, uh, you know, be, be open, be mindful, and, and hopefully you can find something uh, out of our conversation to apply to your daily life. And on occasion, especially in times like these, when uh, things can be a little bit tough and people have a ton of questions as their training has been upended and uprooted, their motivation might be stagnant, their race calendar is now officially blank. Uh, you know, it's funny how we always put races in like, you know, pen. And then all of a sudden you wake up and one day there's nothing. Uh, and so I, I threw into our, uh, our closed group on Facebook, which is called Crushing Iron Group. If you want to pop in there, it's just a simple question. You can hop in there and ask it. Um, and I kind of did a little call out this morning for questions. Uh, hey, you know, might as well uh, open it up and see what happens. It's usually one of our more popular podcasts as we hear from our listeners. And we always appreciate and value them tremendously. Uh, so pop in there and yeah, I'm excited for the questions and we'll do our best today to answer them and get through more than three. Yeah, we'll do that. And, uh, is that, I'm interested in training peaks. I haven't really noticed, but does do, um, these races that get missed, do they show up red? <laughs> they, they, uh, they actually say, if, I think event like past or event completed, um, if you put them in as a, in, in events, but, uh, no, I, I don't, I'm not sure they do that. Most people just okay. delete them like, you know, like religiously, like some athletes I have, like if they miss a workout, they delete it. And I'm like, I saw you do that. And so sometimes just to kind of be ornery, I'll kind of re up, put it back in there and leave, leave it red. Um, because people, <laughs> and, and I want to, I'm going to talk a lot about training peaks day and athletes like utter obsession over so many things that it, that's in there. And the fact that if it just didn't exist, none of it existed, no training peaks existed. And there was just, we were still living in a simple platform life of spreadsheets and notebooks and perceived effort, how your obsession over what are oftentimes just utterly meaningless numbers, why you find them borderline biblical. 
while still having very little knowledge of the specifics behind them, but you judge your training and your fitness behind them. But I'll go to the, I'll go into that in a minute. Um, but first, I just want to check in with you and see how you're doing. Hey, I'm doing good. And before I forget, I want to put out that information about our online hub real quick. Yeah. If you, well, if, hey, I mean, yeah, no, it's all you, man. If that's how you're doing. This is what you want to do. Then it's your time. Go for it. You good with that, man? I'm good. Uh, about it, man. I'm full of optimism we, today. We have a what we call an, at c26triathlon.com. That's our um, hosting site, and we have a section called the online hub where we're adding more and more informational entertainment, uh, all kinds of good stuff, videos and things like that. Where it's uh, it started as a additional resource for our athletes, our coached athletes, and now we have. Uh, decided we want to open it up to everybody and we've done a pay what you want situation where it's nine dollars twenty nine dollars or forty nine dollars and that goes through the end of september and there's just tons of information in there and it's a really good resource for you know kind of they, I, we were kind of thinking about it mainly because of what's going on and everything like that we just want to be a a place where people can go and get good stuff and and uh, kind of stay on course so that's sitting there. You can go to it. There's a tab that says online hub um, and then a drop down that says a preview. You can kind of look at what's in there and decide to buy in there if you want. And we appreciate it because, uh, you know, it's kind of another way to support the podcast, too. We've been doing these for three and a half years. And yeah, man, a while. There's really a lot of good information out there. And that's not from me. That's from a lot of people that say that there is. And um, so... <laughs> You know, uh, people always ask, too, how can I support the podcast? And we've really never had a way. And this is sort of a way to give you something with uh, and give you something more, I guess. You know, good value for something instead of just whatever. So anyway, I want to put that out. I'm doing great, dude. I am, uh, you know, occasionally weirded out by things, you know. Um, yeah, but that's that's not really different than like the other it's 360. True. <laughs> yeah, it's I was going to say, that's like, so, I mean, so things are good, man. Like you're 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 feeling it normal. I am in a, in a little way. I mean, you know, obviously we kind of work in uh, isolation uh, sort of from I've been yeah. working from my home for so long that that part is not an adjustment whatsoever. Uh, the weird part is when I occasionally venture out onto the uh, streets and go into society, there's nobody out there. Right. And Nothing. so it, if you let your head I was talking to somebody last night about it, if you kind of let your head wander into the weirdness all it, it's real easy to get a kind of a loop going or a, or a snowballing you know because like oh my god nobody's out here is anybody a lot you know like you start thinking all these weird things i think i can't remember if i told this on the podcast but the other day i was uh i dropped my mom was in town her friend was in town we had to go down to her daughter her, my her friend's daughter's place down south and we were coming north on friday night about nine o'clock and uh, slowly but surely, I-65 started veering off with cones into the right, right lane, next lane, next lane, next lane. There's five lanes. And by the time I got about three miles from downtown Nashville, they had barricaded the whole uh, interstate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first thought was rainy and gloomy out and everything. Yeah. Me and my mom were like, are they shutting down the city? <laughs> that's really what I, I mean. That's like where your head went. And I was the whole yeah. ride home. My mom and I were just quiet. For like 20 minutes, not saying anything. It's just There's in so our heads. There's so much head. going on there, though. That yeah, but they... that's what it was. I, I looked it up when I got home. But the point is, is like, you can see these numbers or look at these. Uh, like I love, you know, I love these heat maps where they they show New York City and it's like the whole, the blob covers the whole state, you know. And it's just like uh, again, I always go back to media and how we used to do this. It's like you know, imagine like if that was, you know, there's like. All, like I looked it up. I've just been looking at stuff and just like trying to keep perspective, you know, because yeah. there's like uh, I looked it up and there's like 3,000, 3,200 car accidents a day or something like that. Yeah. And I just got to thinking, it's like, wow, I wonder if they started like the news just started putting car accident blobs up in these heat <laughs> apps and stuff. People wouldn't drive, you know. So I'm just trying to like. I'm really just trying to stay kind of like balanced and look at things like, okay, this is, you know, this ain't good, really. This is not a good thing, but let's not go overboard and let, let, let our heads run away with us. And let's just take it day by day. And yeah, and that's really all we can do. So like you, the sun is out and that's a big deal. It's been it's a really a huge deal. couple of weeks with all this stuff. I know, dude. It's been, it's been my like, neighborhood went rainy, through a tornado. And... I know. It's like, hello, Mother Nature, give us a break. And it's like, now, 
the sun is shining upon us and things are more opti uh, optimistic. And, you know, I think like, you know, if we were hunkering down here. Ali and I both work from home for the most part. And balancing that with like a three year old has been like incredibly difficult, uh, mm -hmm. you know, finding, figuring out like how to figure how to get to do the things for him that we need to do and not be too rigid, maybe flexible. And so, you know, hey, some days are good, some days are bad, some days are more challenging than others. But, you know, I've found that like the more flexible and, and non-rigid that we try to be, the the easier the day comes. Because obviously he's going through a, a rough patch too. He has no idea what's going on, which I think is awesome and we're thankful for. Uh, but he's so used to, he's a routine oriented as well. So it's, it's just meant for everybody. But, you know, I think there's a lot of positive we can, we can take out of it. That was even like one of the questions uh from the facebook thread now that we can dive into i won't we'll start with that one but um if you're ready i am we can hop in and see how many of these we can cover i do want to say before we get rolling and this might sound harsh okay. this might sound a little bit rough uh, but welcome. so many things that are often asked are can be easily solved by just critical thinking a thoughtful process and common sense uh, we like to overcomplicate everything, and then we like to expand them into the widest generality we possibly can. When so many things are specific to us, and we like we none of us like to be confined or controlled. Yet we find ourselves, you know, like that right now. Yet we we love to do that when when in terms of being specific, but then also making things general. So well, so many of these things, like if I say, well, that's totally relative, it's good. It is like you use, you, you know, your body and know yourself better than anyone, better than some triathlete magazine article, better than uh, plenty of coaches, better than a training plan, better than training peaks. You know yourself better than that. Listen to yourself. Ask yourself these questions. See what makes sense. Like go through, you know, critical thinking. Like I, when my athletes ask me questions, I ask them a lot of questions back. It's not because I want them to feel stupid. It's because I want them to be a part of the process and getting them to critically think. And that's why that's why you have teachers to get you to critically think. It's not, you know, you just memorize people. You can memorize things, or you can learn how to apply things and think things through. Um, but does the, that's just a little caveat, a uh, little, you know, small print, uh, fine print, I guess. Yeah, but I like that one, dude. It's just, it's just like, just think. Like, a lot of it is. And just don't and, and think and don't blindly follow, which is another huge, like, mistake uh, triathletes make. Um, first question, Aaron Christensen, is there a swim workout that can be done in open water or is the workout to just swim? Uh, and I, it's a great question because a lot of, uh, well, not a lot of us, but many of us are about to find out that we have an opportunity here in the next probably two months. The outdoor temps are going to go up. The lake temps are going to go up. I, I wouldn't, I can't even begin to speculate what they're going to do about areas like the one that we have at Anderson Road Beach where a lot of people can congregate because people are um, specific states and counties are closing parks. So I, so, you know, if you're going to ask me, like, what's allowed and what's safe, don't ask me. Ask the CDC. Like, I I'm just I'm not even like closely qualified. So I don't like being asked to speculate things. But in terms of when you do find yourself in, with the opportunity, whether it's in two weeks, two months, two years, for many of us, the best thing you can do when you get in open water is just to get comfortable is to just become comfortable in the water and because if you can't be comfortable in a race uh in a race you know specific scenario and environment then you can then you're never going to be able to apply the fitness that you've earned and gained from the pool now if you can sight perfectly straight this is one thing we cover at camp uh is it mean it is utterly meaningless if i can make you swim faster but you have no but you are inept at siding and swimming straight because now I've actually just made you slower because now you're just going to swim faster in the wrong direction and have to overcorrect. So there are things you would, I would oh, for, first getting comfortable, uh, get comfortable in your wetsuit, you know, cause the, your strokes, the most people's swim stroke feels different. People complain about, you know, tricep fatigue, shoulder fatigue, uh, fatigue, their neck gets, you know, a little bit achy. They're not used to siding, like lifting your head up every two to four strokes. Like people really underestimate, 
the impact that that has. It's very similar to when people sit up on their bike all the time, then go out and they ride arrow or they put on their helmet for the first time. They're like, man, my neck was so sore. And that's, that's a, that's a combination of not being in a specific posture in a specific position for long periods of time. But it's also more than likely if you're outside and also in open water, you're out, you people swim more tense, you know, like when you're in, in nature, when you're outside, when you're outdoors, you feel like you have less control. It's, it's very common for the body to kind of like get kind of rigid. Um, and so Damn. if you're out there, just, first of all, just get out there and enjoy being in the open water, you know, swim steady, swim easy, focus on swimming straight. Once you've completed the task of swimming straight and being comfortable, then you can start to insert, uh, workouts. And, and for me, I, you never do them by yardage because if anyone's turned on their Garmin outside and many people do, because they'll like, it's funny, man, like how athletes are obsessed with like monitoring and recording everything in training peaks like they'll they'll training peak like the walk with their dog and have that put in and i'll go into that in a minute when i go into like chronic training they do and then they then they obsess about other numbers that are that are totals of their accumulated stress anyway i'll go to that in a minute i always do stroke rates or, or stroke counts swim yeah. 50 strokes hard 50 strokes easy because you can count that if you go in open water, your garment's never going to be accurate. I think it's just, it's a joke. It's kind of like your wrist heart rate. Go out there, do like 20 strokes hard, 40 strokes easy, whatever you want to do. Just, you know, practice sighting. Um, do that. Don't focus too much on trying to do yardage. It's 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 just a time to get comfortable and be safe, uh, especially, you know, when you're out there, uh, depending on if it's a protected body of water or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously we've we've got a long history of open water training, you and I, and I started with you a long time ago, and I could not agree more with what you're saying. I think it's just, it's all about taking, it's like a dry run, you know, because a lot of people don't get in open water a lot, so if you only get in there, free, you know, infrequently, you just get used to it, but there was also this thing that, uh, you know, we were in a protected area and there was a buoy that we kind of considered probably about, I don't know, 150 yards out or something, or not that, maybe it was like a hundred, I can't remember. And we would go out and back and do that kind of stuff with, you know, more of like a little bit of rest and go out and back. And um, for me, there's, you know, there's always going to be, the stroke count is absolutely what I would think people should do as well. And you know, you can kind of like, depending on where you're at, you can kind of figure out like if there's a, a pole or a buoy or a tree, you know, you can kind of gauge your distance based on that too a little bit. But um, what I like to do too is, is uh, like you're saying, swim out, swim out 50 kind of under control and then bust it hard coming back in or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we used to do with the buoys out and backs. And, and I remember we used to do that. Um, and, you know, cause we would have maybe a 3000 meter swim in the pool earlier that week. And then we'd go out to the lake and we would do all these like open water kind of, uh, you know, control your speeds and go hard a lot of times. And, and I asked you one time after we did probably like 1600 out there, 1700 mm -hmm. open water. I was like, dude, I'm a little, this is my first year. I was a little concerned that that, uh, you know, might not be enough or whatever. And you're like, dude, this is like. The way we swam at it, we went after it and stuff like that. You were, I remember you saying that that was easily comparable just because oh, yes. and it's, a, it's a weird juxtaposition for people sometimes um, that, that think that, uh, you know, you always have to swim certain distances and things like that. Yep. It is, uh, it can be a really great workout, but a lot of it is just, you know, getting out there and getting comfortable. And that really is half the battle. Um Waves, the, all that yep, kind of stuff. Exactly. Like, it, just get comfortable with the environment and be and and think of it more as not a then like how can I express and get more out of my fitness, but how can I equip myself better with my, my like open water swim you know toolbox to be able to handle any kind of scenario and still be comfortable, because no amount of fitness is going to prepare you for choppy water or hard current or super wind if you are afraid of it or if you're uncomfortable in it because you're just going to panic and then your fitness goes out the window. Mm -hmm. It's about being calm. Um, next one from Joshua Venus. What are some ideas for at-home strength slash core movements we can do while not swimming to keep those muscles engaged? Any kind of core work is good work. 
you know, like if you want to do, I, I'm a huge fan of planks. I think that's probably the, the best thing you can do for swimming is a lot of plank work, you know, uh, your standard plank and then side planks. And then something that I've done in the past when I haven't, I mean, if you have the opportunity to do push-ups, they're, they're awesome. And then wide grip pull-ups are also wonderful. If you cannot do wide grip pull-ups and it's something that we, that we've done is called more like a lat at, lat activation is to and a lot of us can do this because we're this tall if you can't get a chair is to just simply grab like the the door frame you know we most of us have like some kind of a, a rim on top of our door that we can you know put our fingers on is just to grab that and then act like you're going to do a pull up don't do it obviously because you're you know you might break something or you'll you know lose an arm but just grab it and then pull down just to get the feeling of where those lats should be and just doing those lat activations can help keep those those muscles engaged because that's what you're going to want and need when you get back to finally being able to swim in open water in an endless pool back in your regular you know rec center pool or the y whatever it is you're going to need those i think one of the biggest things that that athletes underestimate and triathletes might not even know what this is because so many of them come to swimming you know as foreign and, and, uh, and with no background is that the first thing you lose in swimming isn't fitness it's the feel it is that feel for the water uh, and that is something that you cannot replicate uh you have to feel it um it is something that you have to get back in the water and do um and but in the meantime, push-ups, you know, lat pull-downs if you have access to wide grip pull-ups, or just those simple like the planks, and then just simple like lat lat activation uh, things you can do with like door frames or just grabbing up high for anything and just kind of pulling down uh, real wide will help kind of keep those muscles engaged. Just so you can kind of keep a feel for what uh, muscles you're going to need to use and want to use when you are able to swim again. Wow, I that's a. Uh... That's really interesting to me. Can we just go into that a little bit, the feel for the water? Because I I agree. I mean, obviously, it does seem like we lose our fitness really quick in the pool. I think that's sort of like the lore. And that feel for the water, man, there's nothing we can probably do, right? I mean, that's just – although – I think once you get back in the water, if you focus on that more than you focus on, oh my God, I am so out of swim shape. But if you start mm -hmm. just thinking from the get go, like almost like this baptismal, you know, cause you're going to be out of the water for a while. So the minute you get back in there, that first stroke, just think about how that water feels and getting that good grip of it. It should all be like, so when I, it should be kind of like when I go out and I get warmed up for a race. The only warm up that I do is I do about 10 to 15 meters of sculling and then I swim a couple strokes and then I do more sculling and then I do more and then I do more strokes and that sculling it to me gives me that water feel on my hands and my forearm which is your your paddle which is what you use your primary mover one of the main problems though is that as triathletes and swimmers some some swimmers like they just have they have no feel because you don't feel anything because you're just moving your arms flailing through the water without grabbing any water in order to have a feel in the water you have to grab water you have to feel that pressure against your your form against your hand that's how you feel it it should feel like like, like some like uh, almost a very you know uh, rigid almost unmovable surface while that you can actually move um, but when I go into race day, like that's my warm up. I get in the water. And the first thing I'm obsessed with is getting my fuel for the water. Because if you talk about, like, imagine, you know, and if we've all had this feeling, you go on a long bike ride and you hop if, in a race or something, and you go, you get on a, the long bike ride, 70.3 in Ironman, and it's been super cold and rainy and windy, and you get off the bike and your feet are numb. It's like hard to run. Like you, you have like no feel. Your proprioception is gone. Same thing. Like imagine hopping on the bike and then now they've taken away the the foot to pedal contact. You have no feel of when to engage your hamstrings, where you are in the cycle of 360 degrees of your pedal stroke. That's all gone. Like the first thing you need to do when you get back to the pool is stop obsessing about how long you can swim and how fast your hundreds are. It's to get a feel for the water. That's going to get you faster, quicker, just by the mere fact if you're going to be able to be a much more efficient athlete sooner rather than just going through the motions of flaying with what's likely a poor stroke and no feel for the water. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, because that, that kind of gives you that mind-body connection thing going on because mm -hmm. if you're panicked and thinking about how behind you are whatever in your mind but you should just be thinking about yeah that how do i feel and how can i connect that dot to my brain and be always thinking that yep. and then turn it into a habit i guess yep 100%. where do you want to go next you want to stay in the, in the water here 
No, I'm going in on this one. We might oh, not take. You ready to we go? We might not. We might not take another question. Is this foot kick up time for me? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. Uh, this is a two-part question. Uh, it's going to cover three different athletes' questions. One was from Ernie, who we referenced on actually I think Monday's podcast. Uh, his question: When your next race has been postponed until the fall, how do you maintain your current gains in fitness until it's time for the hard work to start leading up to that race? The next one from Julia. That's my question. Also, I went straight from a 70.3 to Disney's Dopey Challenge, and then a month later did two half marathons that were each a PR within seven days, and now I have nothing until October. My The most like dreaded like phrase ever for a coach. I don't want to lose fitness. And then I'll parlay that with Sam Browning. What is the biggest challenge that you think athletes are facing right now? Staying motivated, under-training, over-training, nutrition, how best to stay on top of it? Without a doubt, simply put, overtraining and obsessing with whatever their training peak says is their chronic training load and obsessing about that blue line. And let me, let me, before I go way in on this, if you're familiar or you use training peaks, they have this little graph on your dashboard that athletes have become obsessed with just for the mere fact that it's available. They've become obsessed with it. If they didn't use training peaks, they wouldn't have any idea that it exists. They go about their, their uh, usual business as a coach that works with a wide variety of athletes, I 100% utterly and always ignore it. It is the most overrated graph in triathlon. The dose-response relationship between training load, like chronic training load, and high performance is like, it couldn't be any farther from linear. A higher chronic training load, which is what you're going to see in your training peak graph. It's going to be like an accumulation. It's this, it's this blue line athletes obsessed about. Like, oh, I'm seeing dips in my chronic training load. I must be losing fitness. First of all, you're making a gigantic, and when I say gigantic, that's an understatement, assumption that your zones are correct. And then what you're also putting in is in a tremendous amount of weight behind the calculations that are including those. And what you're also doing is you're negating the fact that those have no... Um, uh, relationship calculation between when you do them and how you do them in the environment you do them in and then what each training session in terms of sports specific how they calculate something I've seen athletes who pay so much attention to their swim workout that might they may have like messed with their zones and they have a swim workout that that's like a 2500 ease that spits out like 110 stress points whereas a really hard like 45 minute run with tempo or repeats might yield like 45 Tell me what's wrong with that picture. Anyway, it's first of all, it's not a guarantee of improved performance, but athletes feel like the higher their chronic training load, the 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 more fit they're going to be. And all they do is pay in. But the biggest thing is like you have to pay attention to how your training volume and intensity are distributed and don't just simply chase that blue line. So many athletes, hundreds if not thousands, are going to spend these next few weeks, months even, obsessed with and chasing that blue line, which to them is a, um, is a physical and visual representation of how, quote unquote, fit they are. They have been leading up into a race, they know the race is coming, and now they feel like they have this measure of fitness. The biggest thing you need to wrap around your brain is that, you know what? You aren't gonna lose fitness overnight, but you shouldn't be obsessed with losing fitness. You should be obsessed with, when do I need to peak? Reframe your mindset. Reframe your obsession. Stop staring at CTL and chronic training load and TSS scores and stress. And I can't get lower because I want to keep it here because I've got here. You're going to burn out. You're going to get stale. You're going to find yourself in a constant state of overtraining. And then you're just going to sit there for months and weeks as the unknown race calendar never appears and you find yourself in November so burnt out and so stale with no improvements and then you're going to uh, uh, try to figure out why with such a high chronic training load that one that stayed still has never never um, ended up being this great race. You have to worry about peaking for a race. In order to do that, and you can only, people can only peak two or three times a year. Maybe. Most people twice, and a lot of people, to be frank, should only aim for like one. In order to peak, you have to shed. You're, you should never look at your, your graph in training peaks or the, the distribution of your training load as one constant trend that goes up. 
if you never have any trends that go down, you're digging yourself a gigantic hole. I'll give my our athletes that were, that were doing two different examples I think are really applicable to right now for where so many athletes find themselves. In the hard, like, how do I wrap my brain around, uh, you know, am I losing anything or am I not losing anything? As we just had a bunch of athletes training for Ironman Texas. They were their first weekend to, like, two-hour-long runs and five-hour rides. And then the week later, it's canceled. Here we go. It's postponed. Now what am I going to do? And I dropped him down to two hours. Two-hour rides. Because, let's be honest, I don't foresee Texas happening this year period and if it did it'll be like late like in the fall and then your, your first i said well they've already up to five hours why not just keep them there your body can only <laughs> handle so much in the course of a year it can only handle so much until it just gives up it, until it's just like i can't take anymore i can't absorb anymore it's like looking at athletes who oh i think i can i can totally handle like 60 and 20 hours a week man I, i'm ready let's go all in babe let's do it okay what have you been doing what have you been training oh well well i've been doing is like you know six to eight but i can totally make time for 60 and 20. okay that's great we'll worry about that once you show me you can do 10 to 12 for a long period of time so i drop them down to two then i have athletes right now who are a ton of athletes again for a huge team race in in chattanooga 70.3 where they have yet to make a decision publicly on what they're going to do with that race it's in middle of may and what i'm probably going to be forced to do i hope not but forced to do is they're they're most of them are like towards the end of like their second build phase they're still they're still in like longer rides we're still doing a lot of strength work we're still we're still like messing around with some speed we haven't even touched like race specific stuff yet and then we have a the most of them have a recovery week coming and then what I'm going to do is probably, if they haven't made a decision, I'm probably just going to make the decision to back them down to more of a maintenance load and just see what happens. What you have to wrap around your mind is, A, stop obsessing over this these like training peaks numbers. Because, first of all, you don't even know what they mean. And second of all, you're living under the premise that your zones that are that are the calcu- that are the huge part of the calculation that's being spit out to produce these numbers is accurate. You're giving way too much credit to a formula and a calculation that you have no idea where the numbers even came from or their relationship to success. Listen to your body. Think what makes sense. All right, well, let's see. If I want to peak this year and I want to do really, really well and I want to stay motivated and I'm, and I'm you know, want to focus on what is in the big picture, then I want to have – and this is why so, so many of our athletes do very, very short Ironman builds is that – Listen, the best thing you can do is just stay within striking distance. And your mind and your body have a specific relationship when it comes to training that it can only handle so much before it loses interest and then your body gets stale and it thinks, all right, you can keep giving this to me, but I'm not going to get anything out of it. Because you're just – you're. It, think of it this way. You're going to see hundreds and thousands of athletes who in March, April, and May have taken their hammer, hammer and they have hit the nail. And it's flush. The, the, the head of the nail is flush against the wood. It's done. The work is done. But what they're doing is, is they can, you, we, we've seen this, people do this. They continue to hammer. They continue to hammer. They continue to hammer. I can't lose it. It's got to stay in there. It's got to stay in there. It's got to be sturdy. And the wood begins to crack. That is what so many athletes are going to do by obsessing about losing fitness. It's about peaking. It is not about losing fitness. It's about peaking. I made that a little bit shorter than I wanted to. But oh, I was going to shoot. Uh, you caught me off guard here. Uh, well, no. oh, well, hey, <laughs> on to the next question, Bob. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I have a few things to say about that. For me, like that's always a, um, that always kind of comes back to uh, belief and confidence too. I think uh, I love that nail analogy because, it, like, I would think in terms of, you know, if I'm coming up to a race and I'm pounding that nail down, and I want to live a, I want to live leave a little give there like a little bit of room at the end there anyway, because that's what I want my final, you know, hammer to be on that race day kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like you always talk about like tension and leaving uh, that energy alive and and that sort of stuff. And I mean, you know me, man, like notoriously, I, I know I've missed it most of the time, but not by much. Right. You know, like and my, you talk about five and six hour rides. I've been like an anti five and six hour ride guy just because I don't like it. But so I'm always looking for that uh, compromise. Um, 
but you will never find me like overriding five and six hour rides. And I think that there's some people like per personally, I mean, I'm 56 and, and that's just not in my DNA for whatever reason. So I like to err on the side of like, okay, well, if I did this one or two, five hour rides all summer, um, or six hour, whatever, and I feel pretty good about it and I got done and I feel like, okay, I'm in a good spot here. I'm just going to like sort of look at this as like, uh, let's just, you know, see what happens kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Rather than like I talked about last year, I peaked, I, I didn't peak, but I was in pretty solid shape around chat 70.3. I had a really good race and that's in May. And then I'm racing Wisconsin four months later, three or four months later. And um, I, like what you said about that is like my body started at some point was like, OK, you know, it, it, it doesn't want to go. And I started losing a little bit of mo so I'm always like really careful about that motivational or that, you know, uh, desire thing where it's like I want to I just want to really hit that last ride or those last couple rides and hit them really good and say like, OK, it's sort of like when I was talking about when I'm swimming really well and I know I got four or five, four to five hundred in me or something like that. Sometimes I'll just get out because I'm like, I feel really good about the water right now. Um, I, I know I got it in me. I don't want to wear myself out towards the end. You know, I'd rather be like um, just sort of have this like trigger ready to go and. I think that's a, it's just a really interesting question to think about because now that people have a long time between where they're going and stuff like that, I think it's just, I, I've been telling people just to err on the, on the side of caution, man. Don't, no, don't no like kidding, just, dude. Like, just, you know who I want and you're a baseball guy. You'll love this. I hope so. Yeah. I want, I want the guy who's been in the batter's box prepping himself as best he can taking the right swings, not unloading every two seconds, watching the pitch, seeing how it comes in, and preparing himself mentally, doing what he needs to do to prepare to go up to the plate and hit a home run. What I don't want is the athlete who's been in the batter's box taking practice pitches for four hours. Because if he makes contact, it's going to be less. It's not going to go near as far as you want it to go. Because he's been swinging and swinging and swinging and swinging and swinging and swinging. You want to hit a home run. Obsess over that and just let go of the obsession that is like what you see in training peaks and what you see is this and, and how is that a representation of where I am and how I'm doing and how I'm feeling. Like, dude, just like listen to your body. Like it's I'm telling you right now, shit ain't that hard. Listen to your body. Stop playing training peaks. Drive your life and use some common sense. Distance yourself from it if you have to. And just think, all right, if I want to do my best, can I do can I perform my best all the time? No, you can't. In order to go high, you have to get lower, right? Think of it as and think of it as bouncing like a, you know, a basketball. You know, if you really want it to bounce high, you have to go up higher to throw it down. If you don't, then you got to start lower. It's not going to bounce as high you have to, it's, it's about that, that kind of that spring effect. How much do I have to give and how much can I get out for this short period of time? Because it's not something you can hold on to forever. So that's all I got on that. I'm trying to move on, but it's not doing a good job. Um, <laughs> kind of parlaying that to a question that I had later down the line. For those of you that are struggling with being on a training plan, which is, which is what I'll, more triathletes than I, because more triathletes self-coach and are on training plans that have coaches is if you find yourself or have found yourself on a training plan that was that had a specific date and time for a race to end on, which many of you many of you probably did. I, I bought this this uh, you know training peaks plan, or I, I hooked up with this you know uh, I bought this training plan online. I've been following it. I was at, yeah I was on like week eight and race day was like you know four more weeks out and now how it's gone now it's you know you know bye bye or you found yourself on like a plan that you now you've you've had an injury and setbacks and like now where do I put myself the best thing you can do and this is what I always tell people is go back to the week you got interrupted whether it was from an injury whether it was from life whether it was getting sick right like whether it was or you're racing interrupted and then Go back the same amount of weeks that you've taken off. Don't re because in the biggest thing people do is make this gigantic mistake. Let's say I'm working a 16 week plan and I got sick on week eight or I, or I had some time off with like a knee injury or whatever. So I missed three to four weeks. Now that puts me up to week 12. 
well, my race is in four weeks. I've got to just find a way to start back at week 12. So you're going to, so you're thinking, all right, well, I'm still, I'm barely, I'm not even week 12 ready anymore or week eight. I'm probably like week four ready because that time off, my fitness has gone, has gone down. My fatigue is probably higher. Uh, I lost a lot of energy. Uh, not just to mention fitness, but like my durability is probably lost just a smidge. I need to be careful and then start that far back, go four weeks back, not jump four weeks forward to quote unquote catch up. And nothing, no one's ever been harmed by going less and going uh, by going small and by being smart. Um, go backwards and then try to move forwards. Don't move forwards for the sake of trying to catch up. Mm. And I know it's hard because so many people find themselves in, in that. So, um, you know, Dude, go, I back, love that, go back to go forward. Like that's, that's the simplest thing. Like to go back to go forward. I love that. You know, I can only speak from you know, personal experience. Like, and I think back to, again, my chat 70.3 last year, which was my best 70.3 out of maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 or something like that. I used our introductory, like at the beginner level, there's a beginner level plan that was just sitting in there. And I used that. And I, looked at it like that, you know, kind of like it was a, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was sort of like, I would rather just not go crazy. And I ended up having that day, you know, where it just like came together and I felt good going into it. And that's why I always say, it's like, that's why I say err on the side of caution all the time Mm -hmm. is because this is such a long grind. No, you're talking about like trying to train a lot of people trying to train every day of the year or whatever. It's like, (laughs) you know, you gotta that that's just like something that doesn't just happen you know there's a lot of variables in there and if you're pushing yourself too much and you're not eating right you're not sleeping right and all these other things come into play you're gonna dig a hole that is like you know those types of holes that where people like wake up one day and go you know maybe this sport isn't for me you know Mm -hmm. it's like so it's better to keep looking forward like as in like i want to work out tomorrow i look at that workout tomorrow the worst thing you could say, like, if you start looking at these things and go, man, I'm uh, dreading that tomorrow. I'm dreading it. Well, you want to find something that feels good right now. Like, if, if you're in a, in a weird spot mentally and you're drained by all this and there's anxiety in your life, don't push yourself over the edge. That's like masochism. One way or the other. You know, because that was like a, another part of, and there's no way we're going to get through all these questions today. We'll parlay this next week. But that was another question with like nutrition is like right now, and we get this, I get this question a lot in emails and with other athletes. When people think about nutrition and fueling and body composition, that was another part of Sam's was like nutrition. For me, like there's, no, in my opinion, there's never been a better time to focus on nutrition. You don't have an excuse. You're not too busy. You're stuck at home cook your meals, cook them right. You're not tempted by going out to eat and, and grabbing fast food in restaurants because you know what? You can't go to any. Yeah, you can go to the takeout and get to goes, and, and I support that because it's about supporting local businesses, but the allure for most people is going out to eat and the experience. There's not much experience in, in, in rolling through a drive through You cannot out-eat your way to better fitness. Fitness is always going to win. However, you can eat to improve fitness or you can't eat to deter fitness you i have to have this question a lot of times with athletes when uh when when life happens and we don't talk about weight and stuff a lot on this podcast because it's a sensitive subject but, but you know being efficient is is a byproduct of eating well and fueling right and and focusing on body composition the same could be said for if you're you know used to running 10 minute miles and you're training and you're training and you're training and you're training and then you know i have athletes that struggle sometimes that go on um over the counter meds you know or or prescribed medications that cause weight gain and you see an athlete who's running 10 minute miles and they put on let's say like 20 pounds and they're thinking, I'm just not getting any faster. I'm just not getting any faster. I'm just not getting any faster. Well, that extra 20 pounds you just put on because of the, the meds you've been on is, is a part of what's deterring your ability to see that fitness. It is still in there. It's just harder to express. And so like right now, you have the best time, and the best opportunity to focus on how I can totally set myself up for success. In terms of being a, being a well-rounded athlete that feels better, that can perform better, that can fuel myself, you know, my body. It's, it's, it's just a great time to take care of your car. You know, we always talk about our body as a car and chassis and fueling it and get, taking to get oil changes and putting the right gas in it and doing the, the small things that will make it last for a longer period of time. Right now is that time. 
to detail your car, to clean it out, to, you know, vacuum it, to, you know, rotate your tires, to get your oil changed, to put the best fuel in it, you know, to really take care of it, to rest it when, you know, you're not having to drive, you know, 500 miles a day. Most of you are probably only driving it one mile a day. Like, take care of it. It's, it's, the, it's the car, it's the body that's going to have to take you through life. So watch over it, take care of it. Now has never been a better time to see what you can do to help maximize your performance through potential. Mm. I agree with that, man. You got uh, the thing I want to caution people on, though, is like, you know, there's this tendency, I think, to, okay, I've got these two weeks, three weeks, whatever's going on, and I'm going to fix my diet perfectly. I'm going to start meditating. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to do this and do that. It's like, I think, you know, when you start changing your diet to that something that you're not familiar with or, you know, used to, um, that that's a stress, you know, and that's why I say if you're working out and doing everything, don't expect to be like at the top of your game maybe early on in this dietary change mm-hmm. or something like that, you know, because there's stuff going on. Your body's cleansing and changing and trying to adapt to different uh, foods and whatnot. And that takes a lot out of you. So that's why another reason to kind of maybe pull back and just keep going on your workouts and, and not be balls to the walls on everything that you want to change. Yeah. It's a lot. It is a lot. Uh, the next one, and again, we apologize. We're not going to be able to make it through all of them. But uh, I'll, let me knock out three like super quick ones that are just kind of not going down the list here. But what's an acceptable lake temperature with a wetsuit or no gloves or no boots? Dude, that's all you. Like that is 100% totally you know, your own like ability to tolerate or not tolerate a specific temperature. <laughs> the only thing I would do is to hesitate and throw a caution to you is that don't worry so much about what the the water temp is, worry about what the ambient temperature is. I could probably handle low 60s if the air temp is 90 and I can get out of the water and feel pretty good and I'm going to heat up pretty good. I'm going in the water warm. However, if the water temp is like high 60s or even low 70s and the air temp is 40, no thank you. You know, so don't just obsess about what the lake temperature is. Think about your whole environment and what that temperature is. Another mm-hmm. quick and one was, sun. yeah, in the sun, yeah. Another quick one was that Iron Man was just the Wanda Sports Group sold the rights to Iron Man this morning to another group. What's my take on that? I don't really have one. Like, who cares? Like, it's not going to affect our day to day at all in terms of triathlon racing. I believe the company that bought it for like seven hundred and thirty million or something, the the investor group, at least part of them, already have previous experience with Ironman and putting on races. So I see absolutely like zero effect or reason to kind of go in a longer discussion about that. Just kind of, the same thing happened when Wanda bought Ironman. No, nothing changed. You just kind of keep doing your races. You keep training. You can keep going through that. The other one was uh, from Allison Reed. What do you think about Ironman having virtual races and awarding slots to worlds for age groupers? Uh, I think it's a whole, it's a gigantic crock of horseshit. Um, just to be honest <laughs> with you, like it's pointless. It's 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 literally worthless and stupid. The, you're not. First of all, can we not call these races? Because they're not. You, we are. You are competing in virtual workouts. These are not races. You are not in the real world. They're, they are not races. You want to know why they postponed the Olympics and didn't make them virtual? Because you can't race online or whatever they're doing. It's not a race. And let me go ahead and say this. World championship slots are more marketing for the most part than they are. And this might hurt people's feelings. That's okay. World championship slots are more likely for, for the most part, are for marketing and money than they are for an elite expression of, of talent. Because when you allow roll downs to go to 50 or 60, or as you found at Chattanooga Sunday Point 3, as you stood in the crowd, literally watching the race director at the award ceremony say out loud, all right, does anybody in the 50 to 54 age group want a slot to Worlds because it's in New Zealand and no one's taking them because they can't afford it? And who the hell wants to go to New Zealand in like in a two month notice and ask of work and shell out 10 grand? When you offer up things like that, you diminish calling it a quote unquote world championship. It's a who can afford it? Who wants to go? How can I get there? Does it fit in to my race schedule? That's what it is. So virtual races is giving a, awarding slots to worlds. It's not about you. It's not about people qualifying for worlds. It's about maxing out entry fees so they can make money. 
this is a this is not a this is a marketing move to increase revenue. That's all it is. And what better way to increase revenue than to make and allow triathletes to feel extra special by getting a slot to Worlds as they sit on their trainer in their den qualifying in a virtual race. No, I think it's absolute and utterless horseshit. Hmm. Okay. I didn't mean to kind of like gloss over that one and tell you how I really felt, but it's just, I think it's just a joke. <laughs> like, I didn't but see I think that. they virtual what, what I think what I think they should do is do what they, if they're going to do that is do what they did back in the day when they had 70.3s that were uh Kona qualifiers it's just do them there like what's the big deal like and, and to be honest like when you see people with all these canceled races you know Ironman Texas canceled postponed and you always got the first guy that's like but what about the Kona slots where are the Kona slots going to go where are they going to like you know pop up and like dude if that's what you're worrying about right now like you know bite the wall <laughs> I mean seriously hey. like, there's just bigger things to obsess about right now than where are the Kona slots you're probably not going to get are going to float to like mm. it's just like the entitlement and so the lack of self-awareness and selfishness that per, that's pervasive in our sport and you wonder why people don't want to sign up for things sorry you know it's okay man you you want to know uh one of my uh i guess uh here i was being an optimist at the start of this podcast <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a good sign actually you're coming back uh my one of my secondary concerns about all of this stuff that's going on is this you know, it's really cool that we can do all these things from home and, you know, like the the Zoom stuff, which is blowing up right now. And I read their site. They're like falling. You know, they're just having trouble keeping up because everybody's mm -hmm. doing Zoom meetings and we are as well. And there's some cool stuff. There's really cool stuff on there. But as I think about this, it's like, wow, man, like my I always have, a, you know, I'm like kind of old school, but it's like this virtual world is really like more and more people are getting exposed to it now and more and more people are going to I wonder if like this is going to create even a more isolated type of a society in a way um, and that's like big world kind of thinking stuff but you know it's like I, I think I hope that uh, we kind of recognize it's like hey it's really nice to be around people and be in a community and, and, and you know take not take it for granted anymore instead of mm -hmm really just kind of like going back into a shell deeper and deeper and then the next thing you know nobody's seeing anybody that's like a conversation for a different podcast yeah, I'm, I'm, hoping it's gonna, I'm hoping it's gonna be a, the, the, the i hope it's gonna be different i think it's gonna actually connect people more and want to do things more and get out more i think right now they're they're connecting more than they were before they're just doing it in a different fashion because they're limited um but yeah, definitely a topic for a different day, which is also most of these other questions. But let's do one more, and this is a one that's specifically for you, from our good buddy and friend fighting the good fight on the front lines, going to the hospital every day, who, let's just say this, thank you to everyone who's out there knocking things out, going to work, no matter what it is, uh, especially at hospitals, no matter what your title is. I'm sure it's got to be in, an, in just a chaotic, crazy time. But for Sean, he said, this question is from Mike Turali. You're a big advocate for yoga and meditation. I could sure use some guidance for diverting my mental and physical energy away from my hospital right now. Is there a particular individual or app that you'd recommend for a beginner looking to incorporate more yoga or meditation to help reduce stress? If you don't have anyone that you recommend, would you be open to creating a mic meditation Tarali app where you sit in front of a, a, a hot stove and do hot yoga in a leopard tight skin speedo? <laughs> the answer is yes, and the answer is yes, baby. Um, actually, um, you know, Sean, since uh, we're good buddies and you've stayed at my house, I think you should give me a call if you have a second. But I, uh, you know, the th here's what I was thinking when I saw that question. Actually, I thought, you know, that uh, I posted an article. I kind of put a few of the answer or things in the main Facebook group the other day. I was thinking about actually. Maybe posting that whole article and then doing like a Facebook Live on the whole thing with people. Like just to ask me questions about some of that stuff I've been doing to kind of relieve stress and, and chill during this time. And just sort of my daily pattern. It's really like not directly associated to swim, bike, run type stuff. And I thought that might be kind of fun to go in there and just, you know, have a, a live session. So um, in the short term here with, 
individuals or apps. I don't. I definitely don't use apps. There's a, there is a meditation app called Insight Timer that is pretty good, though. I use that really just for countdowns, or it kind of gives that little uh, sound of the bell when you start, and when you and it has like a calming. It's probably like Calm or any of these other meditation apps. There's all kinds of stuff like that that you can do. But um, and then I've always like there's this guy named Baron Batiste. He's a yoga guy from way back in the days from uh, his family owned a uh, you know granola stores in the 60s they were way out in front of everything like that but he's a pretty good yoga dude um but other than that i've just kind of always i just you know i know obviously we can't go to classes right now but mm-hmm. you know there, these are the things it's kind of back to what you're saying in the beginning i mean it's just there's the information is out there just start doing something you know um there's you know, plenty of videos, YouTube videos that kind of show you the basics, intro to yoga and things like that. And uh, I think that these are all good. And again, it's like, uh, you know, when you get into these things, you don't have to be a guru by like Friday, you know, it's like, yeah, for real, just sit and meditate, you know, just like I always tell people with meditation is just to sit, like take five minutes and just go sit in a chair or sit in like, like Indian style on the floor or whatever you want to call it. And just observe the thoughts and then you know there's no like everybody always wants to talk about how my mind is just racing and racing and i can't calm it down well they call it a practice and that's why it's the same type of thing you just sort of observe the thought and then let it go and then over time you get better at just kind of acknowledging that it's just a thought and that's it, man. let, it, let it go let it go and then that's the whole thing is like uh being able to kind of go, okay, I know I recognize it. I'm not going to fight it. I'm just going to let it go. You don't fight thoughts when you're in meditation. You just observe them. So, I love it. What a great yeah. way to bring us back down from my heated rant of a rational thought, but not to a Zen explanation of how to be Zen from the mm-hmm. master himself, Mike Turali, virtual yeah. junior. Uh, hey, it, that's was fun. We'll definitely, I definitely want to cover these on Monday, uh, Monday's podcast. Um, but that is a wrap for today. I enjoy that. I always enjoy hearing from our listeners and what's kind of going on in their minds and what are they thinking about and or worrying about. And and hopefully we were able to answer a lot of those questions for you. And if you weren't a person who just you know directly asked, hopefully they they will be helpful for you in the future. Um, I don't apologize for the rant because, hey, we're passionate. We just kind of tell them how we feel, and we enjoy that. So we've always done. We'll continue to do so. If you haven't been and want to stop by, the same website Mike referenced in the beginning of the podcast, but our online hub, it is c26triathlon.com. It is a our one-stop shop for all things community, camps, and coaching. Go there. Check it out. Uh, let us know what you think and reach out if you feel like you need to. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can email Mike crushing iron at gmail.com and if you want to email me c26 coach at gmail.com all right buddy i enjoyed yep. it too yeah i did too man I, I, let's get it good going. i got uh, thanks man i gotta go hop off and i'm training for uh, neighborhood world to gotta do some go sprints in the cul-de-sac neighborhood world huh? yeah man neighbor worlds mm. yeah I know, man. Tough times. But hey, we appreciate you tuning in. Hope you're finding peace in this, uh, what can be a difficult time. Go back, listen to some archive podcast. Enjoy yourself. Get out, connect as long as you're six feet away. Get some sunshine. Stay moving. Be healthy. Be happy. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. And come on into the hub. And come on into the hub. <laughs> That's where the people are congregating. All right, man. Thanks a lot, bro. Yeah, take it.